And welcome everybody. This is another conversation between me from Handheld Press and I am talking to Esther Rutter. Esther is not one of Handheld's authors. This is a new thing that we're doing. Um, I'm just talking to authors whose books I'm interested in. Esther wrote this book, This Golden Fleece, which is a journey through Britain's knitted history. And I'm going to read you a little bit from the back cover. Um, from Shetland to the Channel Islands, she unearths fascinating histories of communities whose lives were shaped by knitting, weaving and spinning, among them the mill workers of the border counties and the stocking knitters of Wales, <clears throat> reminding us of the value of craft and our intimate relationship with wool. And it went down very well. Did it win prizes, Esther? It got lots of reviews. It did won a Roger Deakin Award from the Society of Authors, um, which was very gratifying. And um, yes, uh, I think that's the only award, actually, but uh, I'll take it. That's that's very, very nice. So Esther is, um, she studied English at Oxford University, uh, where she held an academic scholarship. And she has worked at the Wordsworth Trust and at the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum. So heritage and literature, that was your initial impulse? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I'm um, really interested in history. I initially wanted to do a degree in English and history, um, but because I would have had to impress two sets of interviewees, my school advised me that maybe just stick to one. So I chose English, um, but I've always really been interested in history and I volunteered lots in museums whilst I was at university. My best friend from university, her parents ran Beamish Museum just outside Newcastle. Uh, and so, yeah, I always loved old things and stories of old things. Um, and it was nice actually being able to come back to that, to write this golden fleece and combining the two things together. And now you're in St Andrews, you're a writer in residence. That's right. It's the School of Geography and Sustainable Development um, uh, are the ones that host me. Uh, and so I'm what they call a cultural geographer uh, rather than a physical geography. You know, I'm not interested in so much in volcanoes and ice sheets and things. Um, but yes, yeah, so I get a use of a desk in St Andrews and I also can use all the university resource, uh, research facilities, so the library, online journals. Um, so it's been fantastically helpful um, in writing both this Golden Fleece and also the book that I've just finished. Good. Well, it does sound a lovely post to have. <laughs> Let us now <clears throat> um, have a woolly conversation. So in the beginning, um, no, not in the beginning, about a third of the way through this Golden Fleece, you talk about growing up next to a sheep farm in Suffolk and your mother was a spinner and you learned pretty early on to do carding and spinning and weaving, not weaving, but carding and spinning and knitting. Can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us what it was like? Absolutely. So it was sheep were just everywhere. Um, so the man who ran the, ran the farm, so this is a small country estate uh, on the edge of a market town in Suffolk. Um, it was, my dad was the head gardener on the estate and the estate included a working farm and the farm was run by a man from Herefordshire called Walford Arnold Griffiths and Mr Griffiths as we always called him we never used his first name um his for in our family uh, he kind of went down uh, in history with his phrase which he uttered pretty soon after meeting us um which was if I see a sheep I have to have it and uh, so, I apologize that was not a Herefordshire accent that was much more Suffolk um and he just loved sheep, uh, all sorts and breeds. And he kept a mixture of Suffolk and Jacobs um, on the, on the uh, fields that were near our house. So they were there all the time. There was the background to my childhood. Um, I lived in that house from the age of five until 12. And so obviously sheep get up against the fence. They scratch their itches and they leave traces of their fleece um, all caught in the in the barbed wire or in the in the wires. And so um me and my best friend and my little brother would go around and we'd collect up all these kind of little, kind of, almost worthless really, you know, the very short staple, um, not very helpful kind of uh, bits of fleece. And um, then we'd take them to my mum and my mum had done a degree in textile design um, at Harrogate. And so she could spin and she could weave and she had an enormous loom in the shed, uh, but which she didn't actually use very much anymore. <laughs> and now I'm a mother of two, I can understand why she didn't. <laughs> around to using it very much but she would have her spinning wheel in the house and so it was like magic to us watching her and um, turning these little dirty bits of uh, fleece so we did wash them we were before we handed them to her and getting to card them using the big carders and brushing and um doing that ourselves and then handing them over to her and she would roll them off the carders into rolags and then she'd feed them into the spinning wheel and then they were oh my goodness yarn and 
she wasn't actually much of a knitter she can knit um but she doesn't really enjoy it but my best friend's mum um was always knitting and so uh yeah wool and sheep and yarn were kind of all around me uh, and I was about seven when I started to knit myself that is a wonderful young age to begin very yes <clears throat> yeah so in the book you describe quite casually different ways of casting on and, and stitches and I'm going I don't know that oh my goodness I had no idea there was a different way of doing this particular thing so you must have had a pretty intense training in knitting just because you picked it up and tried experimenting with things until I wrote this golden fleece I was a very very average ordinary knitter um I was the same I kind of had my one cast on and my one cast off and I could make you know jumpers and hats and things if I if there was a pattern uh that I could follow and I did have a few um <laughs> unsuccessful experiments something that my mother-in-law dubbed my rasta tramp hat <laughs> Well, it was a kind of big rasta hat, it was far too large, my gauge was totally off. And and that actually really was my relationship with knitting. It was some, it was relaxing and enjoyable, and I liked making gifts for people. Um, but I didn't really push myself to learn new techniques. Um, I, In fact, really what I used it for was stress release. And so uh, I had these you know, these kind of jobs working in heritage, literary heritage, and then um, we moved to Fife. My husband got a job at the University in St Andrews. We moved to Fife. There isn't a literary museum in Fife. Um, and I didn't really want to commute back into Edinburgh every day. And so I decided just to get an arts admin job. Um, and it actually ended up being in the fundraising department for the university. And I just really disliked it. It wasn't really me. I, it wasn't a terrible job, you know. Um, there are a lot worse ones you could do. But it didn't really give me what I needed. It didn't really make my heart sing. And so I was getting home each evening, complaining about how much I dislike this job and knitting to take away some of that frustration. And so it was kind of, it's what really brought the book into being was I was doing all this knitting and I was looking for a book that told me the story of knitting and the kind of the history of it that wasn't like a technical guide to learning different stitches but I just wanted the story of it and there just wasn't one um there was a more kind of technical history which um the then Bishop of Leicester Richard Rutt had written uh which isn't in print anymore it was published by Batsford uh which I did get a copy of and I did enjoy the kind of the factual kind of how stitches have been made throughout time element of it um but it wasn't really what I wanted to read there wasn't that kind of narrative um to the book so I thought well I'm not enjoying this job I am enjoying knitting uh I'm gonna jack it all in for a year we agreed that we could manage on one salary for a year if I didn't make any money at it <laughs> and um and yeah, and I would have a year to write this book. Uh, and amazingly, um, that that's what I did. And that's, yeah, well, here it is. My copy has been dragged around so many times I don't have the dust jacket on it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that's a terrific way to write a book because you've got the time and you've got the need and you want to write the book you want to read. That just makes mm. so much sense. So most people who knit know that knitting language is completely incomprehensible to people who don't knit because it's a technical language. There is a vocabulary that needs to be learned and quite often it's abbreviations. You did a little bit of etymological research on how the knitting vocabulary had emerged. Can you tell us more about that? What, what did you find in the way of the words that knitting is described by? So actually it's quite hard to do the research because knitting isn't seen as a subject worthy of academic research in the main at least not until relatively recently and now um, there's been a big research project done by the University of Glasgow uh, particularly into Shetland knitting and hand knitting in kind of Scotland more broadly but actually there's a really big gap <laughs> so to knit means to bind you know obviously you can knit anything together it doesn't just mean the craft of knitting uh, and it goes back it's an old English word it comes from uh, from the Latin netto, netto um, meaning to join so that's kind of uh, literally knitting is binding things together and um, it's not actually a technical definition of like <laughs> how you make a particular stitch although of course it then lends its name to what we call the knit stitch and then the pearl um is known like the etymology of that is the is to twist to pearl is to twist historically um and so it's the twisted stitch uh which doesn't again it doesn't tell you how to make it it's not a descriptive term it's just the contrast the plain stitch and the, the twisted stitch or the looped stitch mm -hmm. um so yeah um it was actually like the there is a very technical, there's a lot more technical um, language relating to spinning um, because uh, it's a, it has been a recognised staple, pun intended, um, of Britain's economy for much longer. 
knitting is actually a comparatively new art form it's only about a thousand years old at least we there's not much that's older than that that's still extant it could be older but we can't prove it um and but spinning on the other hand we know that spun fibers and then woven fibers go back you know that thousands of years um and so uh yeah there's a lot of technical vocabulary and there was a real temptation in writing the book to go down that rabbit hole of the spinning side of it but because I'm not a very good or confident spinner myself and because it's you know in order to spin something to then knit it it's a very kind of lengthy process at least when your skill level in spinning is as low as mine is um so yeah so I did do some spinning as part of the book just to have that experience of what it is and obviously I had learned from my mum but I because my mum's a very good spinner <laughs> picture. I never needed to be as good as she was um so yeah, so it was uh it was also um there was a kind of historically a bit of a gender divide so um spinners were often women but weavers were often men and now we kind of associate hand knitting predominantly with women because we associate it as a kind of leisure craft but actually um, knitting machines which were developed before mechanized spinning machines were operated by men like weaving looms were and they worked in a similar fashion you had to be quite strong um, in order to to actually manipulate the machine it's like a big kind of wooden frame and so it was a skilled profession you had to serve an apprenticeship in order to be a professional what were called framework knitter at that point um so it's again, it's quite different. Our attitude to how professional or kind of technical um, something is um, has waxed and waned a lot over the centuries. Yeah, I was reading um, a history of no, it's a 20th century account of Shetland, just life in general. And um, to my surprise, the Shetland knitters hadn't got themselves organised into a union until in fact the Second World War. No, but no. Before um, that, it was just piecework, and they were terribly taken advantage of. Absolutely. Yeah, the truck system um, whereby they were just um, kind of paid in kind by the people who were buying their stuff. So if you had a shop and you bought in knitting, you would then pay your pay the knitter in things from your shop. Um, so it's a very closed loop system and it, it never meant it meant that knitters could never actually get they couldn't decide a price for their labor and for their product mm -hmm. and they were really in hoc um to this to this truck system and it it, it was, actually wasn't just knitting it was a number of different agricultural products um that were you know being made all over shetland yeah um, but no it's that it's people uh, the placing a value on both the time and the skill that is needed to produce a knitted garment um you know it's historically and continues to be massively undervalued mm. and if you value something yes there is vocabulary there is special words to show how important it is and if you don't value it the words are not there or else they're not known properly absolutely and there's yeah. um there's the a wonderful um american uh, knitwear designer and knitting writer called elizabeth zimmerman and she comes up with the word unvent she says it's not invention if I make something up someone somewhere will have done it before um but I've uncovered it and I'm going to popularize it so you she uses the word unvent uh for these kind of techniques and things and also the other thing is that knitting is um part of an oral tradition or written tradition so knit, written knitting patterns almost there is pretty much none apart from occasionally in like a big compendium of sort of recipes uh, you do find the occasional one in something like that um but there were no knitting patterns, no standardised knitting patterns until right at the end of the 19th century. You got certain shops developing knitwear patterns so they could sell yarn. Uh, and then in the 20th century, and particularly kind of World War II and beyond, you got these kind of standardised patterns with people using the same like K2 for knit two and P2 for purl two and that kind of thing. Um, so the knowledge could, was a living thing that got passed down. So we can't access its history except in the traces that you see in the finished garment or in the traditions that are extant today. So there's not this big like bank of historic texts on knitting. Uh, you have a things that survive in museum collections. You have the oral histories um, that have been recorded and particularly oral histories in places like Shetland where there is that unbroken line of continuous knitting heritage. Um, and otherwise, yeah, you're pretty, if you, you sometimes get little bits in um, uh, story, you know, kind of in, literary texts like Bruce Chatwin's On the Black Hill which uh, you know talks about knitting a family knitting um, where there's a kind of matriarch figure in it and she's making her own funeral stockings which she will be buried in <laughs> so you know that this was done you know okay right well they they made funeral stockings with, like as in to be put away with your shroud 
you know, for when the time came. But otherwise, you wouldn't know that that was a thing that people did. And so a lot of my research was piecing together these tiny little snippets um, into this bigger knitting together, uh, a kind of tr a, compre a more comprehensive history of knitting. Yeah, that does ring bells. Um, I remember looking into obscure novels of the 1920s and 1910s and finding descriptions of, of home dressmaking as part mm -hmm. of the plot, which you simply wouldn't yeah. find normally. But then it was considered such a normal, integral part of domestic life. It wasn't worth writing about unless... Well, that's the thing. It's the stuff that isn't worth writing about. It's the stuff that, yeah, that we wish that we could access now because it isn't normal anymore to us. Yeah, um, but exactly it's, it's, so. it's the kind of, yeah, it's the gaps, it's the filling in. Definitely. So the biography is a collection of, is like a net, isn't it? It's gathering together all these gaps with pieces of string. Um, and that's yeah. kind of knitting as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> right, let's talk about a, all the way through the book, you you separate out the chapters by sort of starting a new knitting project. And some projects are done really quickly in the space of the chapter because they're quite small. Sometimes you do two. And one of them lasts the whole year. And you're knitting a Gansey for your father. Can you tell us about the Gansey? I can tell you about the Gamsey. Um, would you like to see the Gamsey whilst oh, I'm talking? Oh, have you got it with you? That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, here we go. So um, my dad is six foot tall and he is disproportionately long in the arms and legs. He's got a very short torso. So this Gamsey is absolutely enormous. <laughs> It is. That's a very big arm. Yeah. Two kilos. Um, and I made it for my dad because uh, I wanted to knit a Gansey because I knew that there was this sort of, there were stories around Ganseys and there was this idea that, you know, um, seamen would wear them and then they their bodies would be washed up on the shore and they'd be sent back to their village that they came from and they people would be able to identify them because the patterns were so specific to these different villages. Um, and I didn't actually know whether or not that was true, and also my dad wasn't a sailor so and I come from inland Suffolk not coastal Suffolk so there wasn't a kind of Gansey knitting tradition that was relevant to my family but I did think well if I'm going to knit Gansey it's going to need to be some for someone who's working outdoors because Ganseys are designed as work garments and um, they're knitted in very very dense um like the tension on it is very tight so you're using two to 2.5 millimeter needles uh, you're using a five ply yarn with that uh and you're using an oiled five ply worsted spun yarn so the idea is that the kind of the surface almost turns water like wool um is brilliant because it will absorb 30 percent of its own weight in water before it even feels damp uh but beyond that the actual surface of the yarn because it's spun in this way is slightly water repellent it's not like a, an oil skin or anything um but it does have a slight water kind of resistance to it um and it's knitted without uh any seams because if you're in a you know if you're out at sea and you get a bit of water you know against your skin and then your any any seam is obviously a bit that sticks out and so that's going to rub and that is going to create something an unpleasant condition known as sea boils and um, mm. so if you didn't have any rough seams to rub against you whilst you're wearing this garment and um, that was all to the good uh the gansies were also really close fitting um, because you don't want any gaps, obviously. Uh, both you don't want the the cold getting in, and um, but also you don't want a sleeve to get caught in something on the ship. So the sleeves have to be very tight fitting, and so does the body. Um, and that the combination of that and this um, this very tight gauge, uh, and obviously it's all wool, and um, means it's a really warm garment. You're not going to be sitting around in your centrally heated house comfortably in a Gansey for the most part. So anyway, my dad is a gardener and so he was working outdoors. So I thought, well, great, he will have all the same challenges that the um, that the seaman would have had. Uh, but I wanted the pattern of the Gansey to reflect my dad's heritage, because the more I looked into Gansey patterning, um, it was more, it didn't seem to be that um, I couldn't find any reference to bodies being sent back to villages. And um, it would have been expensive and very difficult. And also bodies that have been in seawater aren't very pleasant um, and also burials were quite expensive comparatively expensive so if you found a body um it was probably just going to be left where you found it unless of course there was suspicious circumstances and then been a coroner's inquest and that's really what I was looking through and it wasn't it's not just me that's done looked into this there's other knitting historians um like Deb Galanders um who have looked for this evidence you think if, if they if this was happening if bodies were being identified you'd find it in coroner's reports because that's where bodies turn up and there really aren't 
you know there's very little evidence of uh, of that happening what there are evidences of is people being able to identify individual gamzies that have been stolen for example and so the patterns on them were obviously they they were important because they although different patterns occurred differently in different places um there were several common strands so you would have um i'll show you some of the ones on my desk if i can get the light to fall on it right because that is it's a textured pattern yeah and um, so you've got a can you see there's a long rope line running down yeah from my so it's going right down it's going laterally yeah. across and down mm -hmm. yeah exactly so the long uh, the cabled ropes um are really really common loads of different gansey patterns from all across the uk have them and across from the netherlands as well you find them there um and it seems that that is used as a dividing line between uh bigger sections of patterns and then the patterns themselves, uh, a really popular one is called Tree of Life. And again, can you see that on this? It looks like a leaf shape. It's a, a bit difficult to see. I think yeah, people are going to have to, sorry, rush, to the, so rush to the book to see that. Yeah, but there is, take my word for it, there's a Tree of Life. It's a leaf shape. And um, uh, you find that in Shetland. You find it all down the East Coast, the West Coast. Um, so it wasn't that I... Like the more I looked at it, I was seeing that this, these patterns were being used differently on different in different places. Um, but it was the way that they was written that they had been written down historically, which was tying them to particular places. So one of the first people to do any kind of research into Gansey history um, was a woman called Gladys Thompson, and she travelled around in her <laughs> kind of fifties on her own, um, looking for semen and their jumpers and she would pursue them along harbour fronts <laughs> um, write down what she saw uh, and um, record them in kind of charts and then she would name them based on where she saw them so she would have a Bambra Gansey or a Sea Houses Gansey or a uh, Anstruther Gansey um, but that doesn't mean that they were only worn in those places that's just where she saw them um, and so the tradition has kind of extended into how we record them today to kind of tie them to a one particular place and and use the same names that she used for certain combinations of patterns um but actually it's more that it's a reflection more of the knitters themselves than the wearers mm. because it was the women who made these gamsies for the men and the it seems that most the kind of the biggest kind of tradition bearers of the gamsey knitting were women from the west coast of scotland because they were the fisher lassies uh, the herring girls and so they were the people that left their crofts on the west coast when it was quite you know when there was not so much going on there and they were oh, sorry and um they would travel um actually by boat uh, sorry by train um to follow where the fishermen were bringing in the herring that they were capturing uh, and they would salt the herring and they would put them into barrels and then whilst they were waiting for the next load of herring to be brought in from whatever port you know, because it would, the fishing goes all the way around the coast of Britain. Uh, and so the girls would travel and they'd be at these different ports. And whilst they were waiting, they would be knitting these gamsies. And so it, they would combine all of these different motifs. They would also see other knitters motifs on the backs of the fishermen when they came into port and they would copy them and recombine them. And so I found out that like the history of it, um, whilst there was this sort of lovely story about these bodies being identified, it was actually the mark, the history, the traveling history, um, of um these female knitters that was being recorded uh and so um i decided that each of these patterns most of them have a kind of a name that connects back to the sea um so uh oh, there's often ones about weather um there's in the whitby gamsey um there's the zigzags there are supposed to reflect the 99 steps that go from whitby harbour up to the abbey but actually you find the zigzags in lots of other patterns as well with different names you have scottish fleet which is like a little diamond um flag pattern um and again that crops up all over the place it's not just in scottish gamseys so you have all these different motifs and for my dad because he is a gardener um, I had things like tree of life, obviously relating to plants, but I also put in things like apples. And again, sorry, yeah, really wish I could to see. There oh, that's a one, uh, yeah. Apple shape there. Um, and then this divided pattern here is called ridge and furrow. Um, so it's supposed to be, you know, be like the like the soil that he tilled. Mm -hmm. um, and also there was one uh, dividing pattern that I used. And again, I'll try my best. Yeah, here you go. You see, it's like uh, a railway line. It's kind it of is, two yes. straight lines with bars going horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, that's a stitch called Railroad. Um, I just found it somewhere online. Um, 
another knitter had worked it out but because my father's father used to lay sleepers on the railway that was his job uh, it tied my dad back another generation into his own heritage um so yeah that was um but yeah obviously this enormous job I'm with me I did all this research around the coast of Britain oh sorry around the not just the coast but um all over the British Isles uh, and it yeah it was a bit heavy to be in hot to be working under in the summer I no um, wonder it took so long to make are Gansies always navy blue or do they come in cream or white? No, they do come in other colours. Um, so again, it's they're working Gansies, so working clothes. So you're not going to knit a white working Maybe not. anything okay. for you. It's not really very practical. Mm. Um, and of course, the communities that were wearing these were not people who were going to be having loads of different clothes. You would have one or maybe two working Gansies and then you might have a best Gansie for uh, say a wedding or a celebration or um, a rare day off perhaps um, and so those Gansies would have proportionally far less wear so you do find for example at the Scottish Fisheries Museum in Anstruther you get white Gansies you even get a pale pink Gansie you get red ones green ones and brown ones a mild kind of um, black and white twisted um, yarn that's been used uh, uh, but the majority of them are in pretty good condition, which to me suggests that they weren't being used as the workday gansies. These were the better ones. And that's kind of why they survived, because they weren't absolutely worn thin. Yeah, that um, makes so much sense. I asked about the white because when I was in Portugal once um, I bought yarn there, I was told was a traditional thick iron type yarn used for Portuguese mm -hmm. fishing jumpers for the fishermen who went out after the after the mackerel. And I did wonder about the white, but it was a very, very oily wool, extremely water resistant. You do get undyed yarn in the Channel Islands, for example. Um, mm. The men from one particular village were known as the grey bellies because their gansies were grey from the undyed wool of their sheep. Mm -hmm. um, and gansies were knitted before the advent of um, aniline, um, you know, chemical dyes, which is the only dye you can really use to get this deep, deep indigo shade. Uh, so definitely, and we assume, again, they don't really survive, so we don't really know, we assume that undyed yarn from, you know, huge different types of sheep was used for Gansies prior to the 19th century, but we don't have any photographic records, of course, before that. So the 19th century, you get the ability to dye things really, really dark navy, and you also get the ability to photograph it. And so we can't, we have to guess at the we know that Gansies were used before that because in 1822, the word Gansy appears in the written source for the first time and it appears not as a neologism. So we know that the word was around and these garments must have been worn. Um, but again, it's that hidden history. Uh, we can't kind of access it. We can yeah. only guess at it. Yeah. Let's turn to revolutionary knitting. <clears throat> it's a bit of a jump between Madame Defarge and A Tale of Two Cities and the French guillotine. Um, to knitting and wearing pussy hats to protest against Trump visiting Britain. So knitting as activism is disguisable, but it's also visible, but you can hide it if you need to. It's easy to do, but you can just put it in a pocket. I'm also interested in the idea of the knit knitting being used, well, outside the Holborn Museum in Bath, where I live, you've got this amazing radical knitting tapestry thing wound around pillars. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Holborn Museum is a very visible house that's used in Bridgerton. I think it's one of the houses of Lady Somebody or other in Bridgerton. So now it's an extremely well-known site. And now it's got sort of rogue knitting all over it. But also um, at Greenham Common, when I was growing up, um, Greenham Common knitters were out there rampaging around winding wool creations around the gates and around the fences. Can you talk a bit more about knitting as a radical act, as an act of protest? Absolutely. Um, so knitting and protest, or uh, let me let me rephrase that slightly to wool work and protest, and particularly framework knitting and protest. So um, when we use the term Luddite, uh, you know, to describe people who are resistant to technology, that comes from um, this early 19th century or late 18th, early 19th century um, rebellion of textile workers, um, against mechanized machines. So people who had, you use their hands to make things, uh, whether that was woven or knitted or spun, um, they had to, their livelihoods were at stake because the machines um, were being able to churn out yarn and finished fabrics far quicker than they were. And so they would go around and they would smash up these machines. But the first, um, and, the, and they had this sort of 
uh, a bit kind of Robin Hood esque figurehead called Ned Ludd, who gave, which is where you get the word Luddite from. Um, and actually, the the first people um, to go around doing this kind of thing were Nottinghamshire knitters, and they were framework knitters. So they were the men who were using these frames that I briefly mentioned at the start. They were making stockings predominantly. Um, in fact, it, pretty much exclusively at that period in history, they were using these frames to make stockings. And they were able to make them what were called fully fashioned. So that was where you could basically shape them to have a bit the curve of the leg. And the machines that were coming in were just able to make long strips, which could then be cut and sewn. Uh, so the, um, the framework knitters couldn't churn out because they had to manually um, lift the, um, like the, little, the yarn off the hooks to change the shape of it. It's a much slower process. And they really resented um, these machines. And it was them that first went and smashed up the machine so that it's it's knitting that gives us the word luddite um but actually they also um it's because the mp for nottinghamshire at that time was uh, a certain lord byron uh, Lord Byron was very sympathetic um, to the framework knitters of Nottinghamshire and his maiden speech in the Houses of Parliament is on their behalf to say why are we uh, starving these um, families who are dependent on knitting um, by allowing these machines to come in and, and basically undercut them and, and make them redundant. Um, so yeah, it's um, obviously the yeah there's that intrinsic kind of like the, that it is a hand craft and that it supports people and therefore if you threaten the craft and the product you're threatening the people and um, goes really really far back uh and then i think yeah the the sort of the phrase stick to your knitting this idea that women you know shouldn't be ha having an opinion out in a you know out in the world they should stick to what they know stick to their knitting um means that knitting uh, is kind of viewed as very safe, uh, very domestic, very kind of, oh, it's not nice knitting. Um, but in fact, because it is a medium which can come with a message, obviously you can knit a slogan. And I think a lot of the green um, um, kind of banners and things that you mentioned often had kind of the C&D symbol or peace or women for peace. Um, the, at least I've seen in the photographs from the time and those were a lot. So yeah, so you can actually make a slogan. Um, but of course you can roll it up and you know it's not like a piece of paper that's going to get crumpled or wet uh, and obviously you've got people out in all weathers protesting so knitting is really good for that because it will still be able to be legible <laughs> once it gets wet um, and it's you know, it's just kind of um, the unexpectedness and the fact that you have to uh, like Madame Defarge's knitting is kind of in code isn't it she's knitting the people that are undermining um, her cause and so uh, you know and the <laughs> you know it's not going to be good what happens to them and so it's um if unless you know how to read knitting of course though you wouldn't necessarily realize that that's what she's doing um so there's both the process and the kind of the visible end point um, can both be can be used in protest and again like it's um the book you know because i you know i go to a, an anti-trump demonstration in london because that was politically what was kind of uh going on at the time that I was researching the book and the pussy hat would just been invented and so I made one to wear um so my politics I think are fairly clear from the book but you wouldn't pick it up thinking it's a political text um and so again I think that um it allows craft allows for discussions around a topic in a way that actually brings in a lot of people a lot of different opinions because it's kind of non-threatening so it can be um yeah it can be quite a powerful force for good uh, as well as quite a radical act yeah and just so accessible because uh, yeah you can, absolutely. Knit, you can do all sorts of things right yeah. let's go and look at the heap of stuff you've collected can you show us the bikini the bikini was my favorite chapter because who would have thought that a knitted bikini would not sag and drag it would actually be a functional swimming garment absolutely um the bikini because um i did a lot of interviewing um of just ordinary people who knitted and um, you know whenever I went to a museum or uh did kind of an online event I would ask people to tell me about what their memories of knitting were who taught them to knit um most people uh excuse me and most of the knitters I spoke to were women but most of them learned from other women often a family member or a neighbor um and most of them remembered wearing their first memory of wearing something knitted it's the first time they wore something knitted because I think babies are fairly wheel happy in knitwear um was swimming costumes being or being forced into a saggy damp 
slightly smelly swimming costume that some dear person in their family had made for them or made for an older brother or sister and passed down to them um and yeah and it was totally universal <laughs> I was much your earliest memory of memory of knitwear and people would say oh these dreadful saggy swimming costumes and so I thought well I'm a child of the 1980s that was really not the fashion when I was young um so I didn't have that memory so I thought well clearly this is a cultural phenomenon I need to experience um and, and so I went to the 1940s because um that's the first time that swimming uh, knitwear patterns were kind of being made widely available um and people um were it was also the first time that bikinis had been invented you know um the, it's of a kind of modern invention the, the two-piece um and so I thought well I've, I better better give this a go so here are my bikini bottoms you can see <laughs> they, yeah they're dirty yeah mm -hmm. um and so you might think that they would be quite quite saggy um but actually there are two things about the design of this bikini um that you really need to to sit well to kind of look into in a bit more detail so the first is that it's um knitted in what's called negative ease so when you knit the knitting will either be will either stretch to fit you or drape over you when you wear it um now the if it's stretching to fit you that's called negative ease um and the smaller you make something relative to your size the more it's going to cling so that's what was the instruction with the gauge on knitting so these you had to knit them to be smaller than you were now of course when you knit for children you knit them with room to grow into <laughs> And so these poor children were never going to be fitting into these swimming costumes, not until they were, you know, halfway to adulthood, um, because they were always going to be made, even if they were made the right size, they should have been made smaller to fit close, more closely. Um, and the other thing is that the pattern also included some very judicious pieces of elastic. So um, you've got the uh, legs. Yeah, so is the elastic in the, in the ribbing on the legs or is it woven in? So uh, it's actually sewn in afterwards. Um, right. So it's just a very fine um, elastic that I stitched through the ribbing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, there's, um, there's a sm again, there's a, a little elastic at the waist, but actually the thing that really keeps it up is this thick piece of elastic that you see I've worked a series of holes. Um, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this actually goes above the bum, so around your back. And then you use quite a thick, strong elastic to kind of, so it's place. a waistband, yes, it's like an the, integral waistband. Um, an adjustable waistband um, with elastic. And that mm. was the original 1949 pattern. Um, so that's the bottoms. Now, hold on, I'll just get you the top half. Um, here we go. Uh, so this was a bandeau top. And again, you can see the, the uh, negative ease. So it's it's a ribbing, so it's designed to the little fit when it's stretched out. And this is edged in elastic. And it's also got the the bandeau front so you can hoik it behind your neck as well um so um and i don't fit it at the moment i've had two children since i made this picture <laughs> but uh, i can confirm that and if you buy the book or borrow the book from the library you will see that i tested it in the chilly waters off uh, the northumberland coast um, and it absolutely stayed put and also it kept me warm because obviously, as I was saying, wool absorbs water and it actually is exothermic. So part of the chemical reaction as it dries out is to release heat. Um, it also absorbs slowly. So it's a bit like when you've got a wetsuit and you kind of have that slow kind of seeping feeling. Or, well, you know, when you wet yourself, just <laughs> that kind of slow seeping feeling. It happens in, in when you're wearing wool and um, next to your skin because as I say, it absorbs it slowly. Um, but it, that means it warms up the water as it absorbs it so it doesn't feel the kind of shocking cold and um, so it's actually a very practical garment the only thing that's so practical about it is when you come out of the water and you sit down on the sand and all the sand sticks into the fibers oh it must um, be horrible and, to wash oh dear uh, well for months afterwards when so um after the book came out and i was doing talks every time i lifted these up i could hear this tinkle 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 of all the little particles of sand spluttering <laughs> oh um, my goodness what else so, have, yeah, you got? have you got the gloves have you got the dent dale yeah, gloves absolutely so this was my first and um, i should say to people who haven't read the book um yeah there are lots of garments that esther knits throughout the, the book and there are photographs of them and lots of description about how they were knitted and what adjustments she made it's it's not exactly a manual to 
it's not a knitting pattern book at all, but you do get a real sense of what was knitted and what you might try yourself, which is what I find so enjoyable about the book. Thank you. Well, it's something actually lots and lots of readers have come back um, to me with, uh, you know, they've, they've read the book and then they've got in touch to say, I really enjoyed it. And also you've inspired me to knit a Gansey or have a go at stranded colour work or all these different things. And it wasn't something I anticipated because as I say, it isn't a, you know, it's not a how to book. It doesn't include any patterns. Um, it's just my kind of experience of learning how to do these things. And so it was delightful and it continues to delight me to know that um, I'm encouraging other people to make their own voyages out uh, into knitting. Um, anyway, so this is what I started with. So these are yes. the Dento gloves and they are knitted on 2.25 millimeter needles with Shetland uh, four ply. So Shetland Heritage, uh, Jemison's and <laughs> Jameson and Smith, <laughs> Shetland Heritage yarn uh, in undyed Shetland black, which is actually like, as black a brown as you can possibly get um and then white uh, and then also gray um for the what's called adderback which is this pattern um which is in a dark gray and a light gray and these um yeah this was kind of accidental starting point in a way because i i i jacked in this job then at christmas or just you know kind of finished at the end of the christmas term and then my mum um had bought me the yarn uh, the shetland yarn as a christmas present and for the bit between Christmas and New Year, my husband and I went to stay with my in-laws who live in Grasmere and my father-in-law is the curator of the Wordsworth Museum. And in the Wordsworth Museum were a pair of gloves that looked very, very much like this. And he said, uh, and I, I'd seen them in there before, and he said, oh, actually we had someone, a knitting historian a few years ago, come and work out the pattern. So if you like, you, you know, you, you can have a go. And he, they had the copy of the pattern and they also had the real thing. So I got to study them and then I got to personalize because the, the ones in the museum were knitted for somebody um, from Dentdale in the 1940s, uh, sorry, 1840s. Uh, in fact, there are three different pairs of, um, of gloves, the oldest are from the 1840s um, in the Wordsworth Museum. Um, and so that I, that was me started. I thought, well, there's a historic pattern. I can study them whilst I'm here. And I've got even got the yarn um, uh, to match. And so um, they took me a month uh, and I never knitted anything as fine gauge as this. I had done stranded colour work, but it was painstaking work. And particularly in January when the light levels were really bad, I had to sit right by the window <laughs> to do it. Uh, I don't know how you manage with the fingers. That, oh, that terrifies me. I can do mittens. I can do you know things that just have with the whole hand but to do the knitting round the figure width it's too small for me yes yeah, um but it's also one of those things that once you've actually done it it's not as bad as you think it's going to be and yeah. they're all the same you know yeah. like you're only like <laughs> once you've done one you can do them all okay okay <laughs> i think with that we need to stop because we've been babbling for so long sarah do we have any questions that people mm. might want to ask esther yes um so we have a comment. We have seven so far. So cool. first one is by Amy. Hi, I'm a self-taught knitter and I've recently started dabbling in a spinning wool as I have a friend with sheep. I find that when I'm doing these fibre crafts, I feel a great connection to the woman, uh, to the women that have come before me. Do you feel a similar connection to the womanhood and ancestry during your journey with knitting? Absolutely. Um, and it was... Um really interesting to kind of realize that there had been this big gap or, or a, this sort of loss of traditional skills round about the 1940s so before then um you had generations of stocking knitters actually men women and children working on frames but also by hand um, and they were in wales they were in the yorkshire dales they were in shetland they were in the scottish borders basically anywhere where the living wasn't great and it was pretty marginal and you had to be you had to do a lot of things yourself to make ends meet and um and so they were knitting in the route what they weren't doing was making shapes and then sewing them together because you get a seam as previously discussed and it also takes longer um and so what they were doing was they were knitting and the gloves that i just showed you were, were knitted like that and then in the kind of 1940s um roughly coinciding with um the make do and mend uh, you know ethos of the second world war and making your own clothes generally um you got men designing patterns knitting patterns really for the first time and what they were were couturiers so they were people who were trained in cut cutting um woven fabric textiles and sewing them together and they applied that to garment knitting 
So we stopped knitting things in the round without seams and people started making shapes, knitting on um, single pointed needles. Uh, whereas historically I found that people, you bear with me a second, um, knitted on these uh, pointed needles uh, and in some places circular needles. So you, you didn't have to do any seaming and they had, and I found um, examples of um, tools that helped you with this. So this was a knitting, um, well, it's just like basically you hold your knitting needle in place and then you tuck it, it's, like, it's called a pit stick in, in uh, the Yorkshire Dales, you tuck it in here, you can wear it at your waistband and um, it's still used in Shetland um, because there you had that continuous knitting tradition and it's Shetland knitting is still done in the round, it has never really been sewn and seamed because it didn't have that sort of gap in people doing it, earning a living from it. Um, and then, you know, it becoming a leisure activity. So, yes, yeah, so that was like, I became very aware that there was this sort of gap and that people, a lot of people now, and particularly people who learned to knit between about 1940 and 1990, um, learned to knit on single pointed needles, make a shape and stitch it together. But then when I went to Shetland, that was when I was so aware that people weren't doing that there. And that there were these really particular ways of assembling garments. And one of those was the haps. So these these shawls and you make that it's not the way that you'd think when you look at it, you think, oh, it's just, you know, a piece of knitting and you go back, you know, side and side, side and side. And that's it. But it's not. You start with seven stitches in this white and you uh, you in increase stitches and decrease stitches around a tremendously long, thin piece that makes this kind of wave edging. And when you've got the I mean, it's meters and meters and meters long. And then you lay it out and you pick up the edge stitches and you pick up a quarter of them. And then you do this beautiful knitting back and forth, um, this pattern, and you can do it in one color or I did it in several to create these kind of waves. And you go around and you do that four times. And then you've got basically like a picture frame with a gap in the middle. And then you use, again, backwards and forwards with garter stitch and you join it all together and you don't have to seam anything. You're just picking up stitches each time. And I learned that from a woman, uh, a knitwear designer and a crofter called Donna Smith, who does her own, designs her own patterns, but also sells her own yarn from her croft. And she had been taught by her great aunt, Emma Isbister, who in turn had taught by her grandmother or great aunt. And so, and she couldn't actually, um, Donna's great aunt, Emma, couldn't actually remember how to do the pattern if you asked her to write it down. It was only through doing it, it's like she had the muscle memory and that had been passed down. Uh, and yeah, and so that Donna then taught, you know, then taught me. And so we can follow a pattern, you know, people have now written down these patterns, um, but it's very much a kind of literally a handing on uh, of traditions from women, often woman to woman. And uh, the next question is from Ash. So. Hi, Ash is also a self-taught knitter, and they're looking at exploring the relationship between textile crafts and rebellion, with knitting being such an under-researched field. So they want to know how did you start your research? How did you start the research process yourself? And then mm -hmm. how did you start off the rabbit hole, as it were? Yeah, so um, it started off because of the pussy hat, to be honest, um, because um, it was re uh, released by this little Californian yarn shop for free. Uh, and the idea was that, you know, anyone could knit it and you didn't even have to go to um, the Women's March in Washington. Uh, you could just knit one and then send it off for somebody else to wear. Uh, and I thought, wow, I wonder if this is kind of thing has been done before. And my aunt had been at Greenham as a young woman. And so I, and she had told me about the banners and things and I'd looked for the photographs and things. So I kind of knew that. And then I'd read Tale of Two Cities at university. So again, I had the sort of idea of Madame Defarge and I'd heard of the word the tricoteurs. And I was like, but what is the truth of the tricoteurs? So again, it was just kind of t taking these t little disparate points of information that I did know about and trying to see if there was a coherent history between them or whether they were sort of disparate strands. Um, so in terms of people doing their own research, I think basically if you have a cause that you are interested in, um, start by looking at collections where um, you know that people collect around that. So, for example, if you're into um, LGBT, um, et cetera, rights, uh, go to the v &A because they have an uh, active collections policy around recording the history. And if you want to see perhaps how it might not just be knitting, it might be crochet or sewing or embroidery, um, they will be able to search through their catalogue because they will have, you know, they know that that's an area that people are interested in. And if they have anything, 
they'll be able to show you. And the same if you're interested in women's rights. Um, again, like her collections, which are known, uh, V&A is always a really good starting point in Britain. Um, but actually local history, source, um, local history museums are really good. Like the Wordsworth Museum is ostensibly a museum about Wordsworth, but it's actually really about Lakeland life more broadly. So start with your local history museums um, because often they have, um, you know, people come to them with these amazing like banners um, and uh, they're donated to them because they don't really know where else to go. So they stay in that locale. Um, and another place is the People's History Museum in Manchester, because that has a lot of um, uh, materials relating to demonstrations, to trade unionism, um, and they have a lot of textile collections, again, predominantly banners, but I know that they do have other materials in there as well. Um, so yeah, I hope that's helpful. Liz has asked, do you have any plans for future historical knitting books? Um, this is interesting, actually, because at the moment, um, what I really want to do is to release modern versions of the historical patterns that I did, what, that I did for the book, but using modern yarn weights and with modern sizing. And um, but I don't have the skills to do all of that myself. Um, so the, I'm in conversation with a couple of people at the moment who are interested in helping me with the technical side of it. Um, so certainly the patterns and then any additional research um, because obviously, like I, I finished the book, writing the book about six years ago, but I've continued to be interested in knitting since then. So I'm hoping that in the next year or two, I might be able to release the patterns with uh, accompanying essays. Um, so yes, um, I've also done some research in Scandinavia. I spent six weeks living in Norway um, a couple of years ago. Pandemic really put paid to any, um, you know, extensive travel for a couple of years, and I've got two very young children so uh I want to I'd really like to to do that um more but um no that's not been possible at the moment. Judy has asked about the sweater that you had showed um how did you spell the name of it uh the gam the, the gamsey um the big blue one gamsey yeah. g-a-n-s-e-y now the Gamsey is uh, the other name you might find these jumpers under is Guernsey, like the island of Guernsey. So G U E R N S E Y. Um, and the reason for the difference in spelling is partly a regional pronunciation, because actually I think the word Gamsey comes from the, the um, Norwegian word garn, meaning yarn. It's where we get our word yarn from. So it's a Garnsey. Uh, but if you say that in a Scottish or Northeastern accent, that's going to be a Gamsey. Um, but also there's a really strong knitting tradition on the Channel Islands, the islands of Guernsey and Jersey. And obviously the word Jersey applies to both the way that we spin and the, the items that we wear. Um, so it's not clear exactly whether they Guernsey and Gansey refer to the same thing or two different traditions that run in parallel. Okay. Um, Emma has asked, were Iran patterns similar, similarly used as identifiers of villages and families? Mm -hmm. um, not really, not historically. Um, you know, now um, people who have a Gansey say in their family archive and want to donate it to a museum might be able to identify the pattern based on, say, a Gladys Thompson book that says, oh, yes, it's the one that Gladys saw at Whitby. So it's known as Whitby 2 um, or whatever. But no, they're actually, historically speaking, there doesn't seem to be any connection or any instances where um, an individual jumper would tie you to a particular place. It was more that the people who are making the jumpers would combine all these different motifs from, from across the UK. Um, I wish they, you know, it would be lovely if they did. And I think actually, and this is one of the things of like, this is such a flexible fluid history that we continue to contribute to. We are as knitters, tradition bearers in it. So if you want to design a Gansey and make it from your village, then you could absolutely do that. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't devalue the Gansey knitting tradition. It just means that you are contributing to it. Um, Sarah has asked, uh, what pattern is the lovely cardigan that you're wearing now? Oh, well, thank you. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is the field cardigan by a Danish designer called Camilla Vad, V-A-D-D. Um, you can find her on Ravelry if you use Ravelry. And she also has her own pattern website. So Camilla, like Charles and Camilla, and V-A-D-D. Uh, and she does it as a jumper, uh, a sweater, as a slip over. She has it on mittens and hats. And it, it's a beautiful design. It's, um, yeah, I absolutely love it. Uh, and it's supposed to be like ears of wheat. But because I did mine in bright red for Christmas, I, um, I, I think of it as berries instead. Okay, so we have an anonymous uh, question coming in. Um, how well do you think that Tom Daly has popularized um, knitting for men or by men? Oh, yes. Thanks to Tom Daly that I've been on the BBC Today programme. 
which um because he was knitting obviously at the olympics and it became a real, real talking point and people wanted to find out more about it so um yeah i think it's funny isn't it you can have all these women so extremely skilled all over the world knitting for centuries and it takes one man on mainstream television so we can go oh knitting <laughs> So I think I think it's great that Tom's a knitter and I think it's great that he's popularising it with a new generation. I think that's fantastic. Um, and I just want to make sure that everybody else who's a skillful knitter uh, also gets a little slice of that credit for their own skills. Um, so, yeah. Catherine has um, asked, do or did women wear Gansies? Very interesting. So, um, yes, uh, there are photographs of fisher women in fact if you look in my book there is um there are some um historical kind of 1920s 1930s photographs of women um working with the fish you know out, out on the harbor wearing gansies um but also wearing things that look like gansies but aren't so um they obviously did wear them but they also more and I think it's more common, or at least there are more photographs of it. They wore like um cardigan versions with little mother of pearl buttons down with kind of three quarter length sleeves uh, and very tight fitting, very kind of figure hugging. Um, and partly women didn't really wear jumpers um, until the middle of the 20th century. Uh, cardigans and fitted bodices, jackets were much more popular. Um, so if you're thinking about what they were wearing on the rest of their body, they would be in dresses. They would have corsets uh, and a kind of bloke's jumper over the top really wasn't very fashionable um so yes they definitely wore things that were like gansies i don't actually know what they called them um those particular kind of cardigans that they wore um but yes they wore they wore gansy like things certainly um what is your next project adventure or book that we can look forward to this is my next book which comes out on the 7th of march and um, you can pre-order it now and it's called all before me a search for belonging in wordsworth's lake district so um this book came about because uh, during the pandemic, um, obviously uh, me and my husband and uh, at the time our very young daughter were stuck at home and my husband's family all come from the Lake District and we couldn't go and visit them and we couldn't go and walk in the hills and we all really missed that. Um, and so when I was thinking about what to write, uh, I kept coming back to wanting to write about how I came to be in Grasmere because I'm not from Grasmere I'm from um, the southeast in Suffolk uh, and the story of me coming to Grasmere um, is also the story of me having quite a spectacular um, nervous breakdown when I was in my early 20s uh, and coming to Grasmere was a very therapeutic time for me um, and it kind of put me back on my feet and I I started writing it because I wanted to be back in Grasmere because it had been so transformative and powerful and interesting and enriching a place at another difficult time in my life. And um, so, yeah, it's the story of my breakdown, my recovery in the year that followed this kind of this golden time um, when I was in my kind of early to mid 20s. And. Um, and it's all set around Dove Cottage. So this is William Wordsworth's house, Dove Cottage. I was working in the house during the day, uh, giving guided tours and doing um, you know, research and cleaning the museum and all this sort of uh, things. And then in the evenings, um, I was starting to write, I was going walking in the hills uh, and I was part of this wonderful creative community that's been part of Grasmere since the time of the Wordsworths, um, since you know December, 1799. Um, so uh, some people have said some very nice things about it. Um, which is lovely some advanced readers uh and you can order that from any um bookshop um anywhere you like I, if you can order it from an independent bookshop that would be fabulous because it keeps another bookshop open the more that people use them um and yes uh, so there's no knitting in it uh there is quite a bit of me quite a bit of william and dorothy wordsworth and quite a lot of other stories of some fascinating people that i met through my time in grasmere when Dundee University came independent from St Andrews, they wanted a Dundee bonnet to cap um, graduates. Oh, Dundee was um, synonymous with bonnets and there is still a bonnet maker craft guild. They mm -hmm. found none of these bonnets still existed because they all had been used to death. So they made a bon so they made up a bonnet to give to the Queen Mother for graduations. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so these bonnets crop up. Um, they get them at Edinburgh University as well. It's John Knox's breeches and bonnet uh, that, you know, the graduates receive their tap on. That. <laughs> and it's fascinating. I didn't realise that Dundee had uh, kind of sought, it, sought out its own. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for bringing that to my attention.
Okay, and from Helen, wondered if you'd seen the film The Nettle Dress, um, mm -hmm. also a Facebook group, and what you think about the weaving and knitting with plant fibres. Yeah, absolutely. I think The Nettle Dress is an absolutely beautiful film, um, really, really poignant, really bittersweet, um, a real testament to that, the the uh, the central character's kind of, or person's really, so he's not a character, he's himself, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but anyway, um, his skill and his commitment to kind of honour his wife and the honour the process of making um, and making this dress for his daughter. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and I would totally recommend going to a screening if you can get one near you. Um, I, I really like knitting with plant fibres. I have knitted with nettle. Um, the British um, knitwear designer and now yarn designer, Erica Knight, produces a lovely yarn. Um, oh, wild wool. It, wild wool. Yes, which I've used that. It's wool. gorgeous. It's really, really nice. It's so soft uh, and it comes in a variety of colours. Um, and so, I would, yeah, I'd really recommend if you fancy having a go with nettle, start with Erica Knight's Wild Wool. Um, and then other plant fibres, uh, linen is really good for knitting summer garments um, because it's really uh, like, you know, it doesn't absorb um, heat. You know, it doesn't uh, it doesn't insulate uh, like wool does, um, but it's obviously it's a natural fibre. Um, and actually, historically, it was produced loads in the area that I live in. And actually, I live in an old linen weaver's cottage just by chance. <laughs> so I've got a real soft spot for linen. Um, and uh, in terms of linen blends, if you go to Blocker Yarns, they do a linen blend. I think it's called, I want to say Tamer. No, it's Lioness. Um, it's called Lioness, uh, which is a wool um, linen blend, um, which is really good. Uh, obviously, you can knit with cotton as well. Um, if you can do you try and knit with organic cotton um, just because there's so many toxins involved in pro commercially produced cotton um, and also uh, cotton uses a tremendous amount of water to produce a cotton fiber compared to a wool fiber so again if you're thinking about kind of environmental impact knitting with cotton yeah just um just kind of have a think about where you're getting it from and, and is it being sustainably produced um, and Pima um, do a really good cotton yarn and cotton use if you have to use cotton to knit with use a cotton pattern do not substitute cotton for wool because cotton doesn't have the stretch and it's much heavier so you'll end up with a really heavy blocky brick-like garment that you can't move in whereas a wool version you've got much more flexibility i would not knit with cotton i i don't think it's worth it sew with it by all means but don't knit with it yeah i think for me cotton um Cotton blends you can kind of get away with if you have it mixed in with something else that's got a bit more kind of give um like kate is saying uh for me, what I knit with cotton is dish towels, you mm. know, because it's really good for that and you can boil it to wash it so you can make it really, really clean and get rid of that horrible dishcloth smell. Um, so, yeah, I do, I do have some and flannels as well. It's good for that, too. Um, so, yeah, those are my top cotton things that I make out of cotton. I can recommend mm -hmm. um, The Thread of Life by Claire Hunter which is a wonderful story, well, it's a wonderful book about stitches and embroidery and textiles and so on all over the world. And Cassia Sinclair also wrote a book, I think, called The Golden Thread, which <laughs> is absolutely tremendous. Is that one that you've got? I don't uh, I have a copy of it. I think it's downstairs on my nonfiction rather than knitting specific shelf. Okay. <laughs> yes, and absolutely. Um, I would totally recommend Claire Hunter's book, um, Mm. And in fact, she's also just written a second one, which is a history of Mary Queen of Scots through her embroidery, um, which is also fascinating. So, yeah, for more broader kind of needleworking histories, um, totally agree with those. Um, for knitting, um, this is one of my favourites. Uh, so this is a mixture of patterns and essays published by Susan Crawford, the Vintage Shetland Project. And so um, Susan excuse me, who is primarily a knitwear designer, um, has gone through the Shetland archives and re, uh, kind of re what is called reverse engineered all these amazing patterns. Um, and then she's also told the story behind each of them. Uh, and you can buy this directly from susancrawford.com and um, from her website. She's actually now got a second volume of this. And she's also got a book called Stitches in Time, which is other designs that aren't particular to Shetland. So yeah, if you want that mix of n learning how to make something and the story, Susan Crawford is brilliant. Um, this, these you can really only get secondhand in the UK, but US folk, I'm sure, will be able to access these really easily. In fact, you can buy them directly from Schoolhouse Press, which is run by Elizabeth Zimmerman's daughter. So this is Knitter's Almanac. Elizabeth Zimmerman is really the first woman to write about the culture of knitting. 
um, in a popular way. Uh, she Here's a picture of her. Uh, she died in, I think it was 1998. Um, uh, but and she was on television in the US on PBS, um, showing people how to teaching people how to knit. And she, it was her that came up with this word, unvent. Um, so yeah, I totally recommend this because you get a mixture of history of how to do it and that broader cultural kind of things that knitters do. Um, also for the mixture, Shetland Wool Week produce this annual every year, and they also have back um, copies from previous years, and you can order directly from the Shetland Museum website. And um, Shetland Wool Week, it's a mixture of beautiful patterns essays recipes uh they're totally gorgeous um and there's a new one every year and then for anyone fancying gansies and wanting to know more specifically about the history of gansies i recommend Di gilpin's the gansy knitting source book which is a, um, a combination of the photographs of uh, historic gansy wearers and also um stitch patterns so that you can combine them to make your own gansey uh, and then at the back there's 10 patterns a kind of ready-made patterns for using gansey motifs in gansies and um, there's children's adults and then accessories as well um so yeah. and also kate davies kate davies publishes her own books under her own imprints kdd designs and if you go to her website kate davies knitting um you can yeah, order those direct. And she's done a huge range of inspired by loads of different places across Scotland and the UK. And they those books also come with the history of knitting. So there's one on yokes, for example, another on hats, the shawls, um, one particular to the island of Isla. Uh, and they're really good as well. Want to see more from us? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to click like, subscribe or new content alert.